Why is it dark at night? Not exactly a tricky question, you might say, but I'm not talking about the day-night cycle caused by our planet spinning on its axis. If you think about it more deeply, the darkness of the night sky is actually not so obvious. Remember, our universe contains trillions upon trillions of stars, scattered almost evenly in all directions. With that much radiation flying around, the night sky should be absolutely blazing. So bright, in fact, that we shouldn't even have the concept of day and night at all. So, what's going on then? Think it's simple? Well, it took astronomers a few centuries to figure it out, and the real reason for cosmic darkness leads us straight into the very foundations of the universe itself. Imagine standing in the middle of a vast, dense forest. Let's assume it has no boundaries, or stretches so far that you can't even grasp where it ends. What do you see in such a forest besides trees? If you shoot an arrow in any direction, it will eventually hit a tree, no matter how hard you try to avoid them. Of course, assuming we ignore Earth's gravity, otherwise the arrow might just drop. This little thought experiment makes it clear. No matter how far the arrow flies, it will always end up hitting a tree. Because in an infinite forest, the trees completely block your view in every direction. Now picture our universe as infinite too, with stars scattered out to infinity, roughly filling space in all directions. Logically, you'd expect that every single point in the sky would contain a star. Just like in the forest, the stars should form a continuous wall across the heavens. Every line of sight should eventually intersect a glowing object. That means there should be no gaps like the ones we casually see when looking up at night, and no dark patches in those famous deep space images from telescopes. The sky ought to be as bright as the surface of our sun. So, why isn't it? Your intuition has probably already whispered to you what the explanation might be. Likewise, back in the distant 16th century, the astronomer Thomas Diggis didn't see any mystery here either. He may have been the first to suggest that distant stars are simply too faint to light up the entire sky. And that does sound reasonable. After all, stars do grow dimmer with distance. More precisely, their apparent brightness decreases with the square of the distance from our planet. A star twice as far away appears four times dimmer, a star three times farther is nine times dimmer, and so on. But in the 18th century, Swiss astronomer and physicist Jean-Philippe de Chaiseau showed that this explanation doesn't actually solve the problem. We have to remember that as distance increases, so does the volume of the visible universe. And that means the number of stars shining in our direction also increases. The problem doesn't go away. De Chaiseau illustrated this very clearly using a concept he called shells, a geometric abstraction. He imagined the stars distributed in separate concentric shells around us, like the layers of an onion, stretching farther and farther into infinity. He assumed that each star had roughly the same brightness, and that their density in the universe was roughly constant. Of course, we know both assumptions are oversimplified, but for the sake of this thought experiment, they're fine. So the first shell lies between one and two light years from us, the second between two and three light years, the third between three and four light years four, and so on. Now it's easy to see that the farther a shell is, the bigger it is, meaning it contains more volume and therefore more stars. In fact, since each shell has the same thickness, the number of stars in it increases in proportion to the square of its distance from us. Here's the interesting part. As we just recalled, the apparent brightness of stars decreases according to the same mathematical principle. It falls with the square of the distance. So, while the stars in the nearest shells are brighter but fewer, the stars in more distant shells are dimmer but far more numerous, enough to compensate for their faintness. Mathematically, each shell would appear just as bright as the one before it. This means every new shell adds the same amount of light to the overall brightness of the sky. Keep adding shells, and the sky should just get brighter and brighter. Clearly then, the fall-off in brightness with distance still doesn't solve the mystery. If the universe were infinite, our sky should shine as brilliantly as the surface of the sun, and we'd never even have the concepts of day and night. De Chaiseau's work brought scientists back to an idea proposed by Johannes Kepler, who, in the early 17th century, argued that the universe is simply finite in size. Thanks to modern astronomical observations, we now know that's not quite the case. In the observable universe, we see no sign of an edge. 
Maybe then, it's about the distribution of matter in the cosmos. After all, we have star clusters and galaxies, don't we? But in reality, that doesn't change much, because the distribution of galaxies can be treated as roughly uniform on cosmic scales. Point your finger anywhere in the sky, and you'll hit a galaxy. In 1823, German astronomer Heinrich Olbers took a serious stab at this problem, which would later bear his name, Olbers Paradox. In his paper, he confirmed that the faintness of stars doesn't solve the puzzle and suggested dust and gas as a possible explanation. He argued that interstellar clouds might simply block the light from distant stars, or in more modern terms, from distant galaxies. What Olbers didn't realize was that dust and gas don't just absorb light, they eventually re-emit the energy they've absorbed. If the universe has existed long enough, then dust, after soaking up radiation, would end up radiating it back into space. That means space would still be filled with the same amount of energy. In other words, dust would act as a kind of middleman, shining just as brightly as the stars or galaxies it obscures. So, the reason must lie elsewhere. And in fact, the real cause of the darkness is simpler, and at the same time far deeper, than any of the proposed solutions. The key is that our universe once had a beginning. Strangely enough, the first well-argued answer didn't come from an astronomer, or even a scientist, but from Edgar Allan Poe. In 1848, just a year before his death, he published his famous work, Eureka, a Prose Poem. In it, Poe outlined his intuitive vision of the universe's nature and, among other things, suggested that the universe is simply not old enough to fill the entire sky with light. He reasoned that while the cosmos might be infinite in size, too little time has passed since its beginning for radiation from its most distant corners to reach us. It's a remarkable case of someone without formal scientific training arriving purely by intuition at a cosmological conclusion that, just decades later, would become central to science. Today, we know that about 13.8 billion years have passed since the Big Bang. And what's striking, astronomically speaking, is just how short a span of time that really is. Consider this, our sun alone will shine for about 10 billion years, and it's already halfway through that lifespan at roughly 5 billion. The universe is so young that beyond a bubble about 13.8 billion light years across, photons are still on their way to us. So here's a good question. How many stars and galaxies are actually inside this bubble, the one we call the observable universe? Are there enough to fill every single line of sight? Well, that can be calculated. Or, more conveniently, you can just find someone who's already done the math online. Thanks, Professor James Imamura from the University of Oregon. So, we need to return once again to our cosmic onion. As we've seen, the key point behind the paradox is that the amount of light we get from a shell doesn't depend on how far that shell is from us. Naturally, then, each shell adds its share to the total brightness of the sky. The more shells, the more light at night. Now we can ask, how many shells would it take for the entire sky to be as bright as the surface of the sun? Let's assume the average density of stars in the observable universe is about one star per cubic parsec, which is actually a bit of an overestimate, but handy for simplifying the math. A parsec is roughly 3.26 light years. For perspective, the distance to Proxima Centauri our closest stellar neighbor is about 1.32 parsecs. So, on average, stars are spaced about one parsec apart, meaning we can also take the thickness of each shell as one parsec. According to Professor Imamura's calculation, to turn night into day, you would need about 2 million billion shells around our planet. Is that a lot? Well, since each shell is one parsec thick, we can easily estimate the size of a universe with that many shells its radius would be 2 million billion parsecs. If we convert that into light years, we get about 6.6 .6 million billion light years, a universe almost 7 quadrillion light years across. That's how big the cosmos would have to be for the night sky to never be dark. Which is, to put it mildly, just a tad larger than our observable universe. About 480,000 times larger, in fact. And remember, this is actually an underestimate, since the real density of stars is less than one per cubic parsec. So there you have it, the real reason we still see the darkness of space. It's because we can only see a fraction of the universe. It's simply too young, 
and the speed of light is just too slow for us to glimpse more of it. Some of you might be thinking right now, wait, why hasn't he mentioned redshift yet? Surely that effect must also play a role in the darkness of space. And you'd be right, the expansion of the universe causes photons to lose energy. Ultraviolet starlight, traveling for billions of years through an expanding cosmos, gradually shifts to lower energies and, by the time it reaches us, might become infrared light. And of course, that's invisible to our imperfect human eyes. So, distant galaxies don't just grow fainter with distance. They also become less bright due to cosmological redshift caused by expansion. In truth, though, this only partly affects the sky's brightness. Its role is much smaller compared to the limited age of the universe and the painfully slow speed of light. Still, the role of redshift will keep growing. The universe is evolving. It's still expanding, and in fact, doing so at an accelerating pace. So the influence of expansion will become more and more dramatic. Because of this expansion, our sky may never be brighter than it is today. Think about it. If our universe were static, its visible size would depend only on time. The more time had passed since the Big Bang, the more photons would arrive from farther corners of the cosmos. Right now, the observable part extends about 13.8 billion light years in every direction. After 20 billion years since the Big Bang, its radius would be 20 billion light years. After 100 billion years, it would be 100 billion light years. In a static universe, after seven quadrillion years, it would finally be big enough for all its stars to blind us. But this is where expansion steps in. The key feature of receding galaxies is that the farther away they are, the faster they move away. Galaxies one megaparsec from us recede at about 70 kilometers per second, at two megaparsecs, 140 kilometers per second, at three megaparsecs, 210 kilometers per second, and so on. Eventually, you reach a distance where galaxies recede at 300,000 kilometers per second or even faster. Yes, objects in deep space can move away from us faster than light. And if that puzzles you, I've made a separate video on the topic. The main point is this, a fundamental property of our universe tied to its expansion will forever prevent light from all stars and galaxies from reaching us. There are regions far beyond the observable universe where light can never outrun the expansion itself. It will never reach our eyes. This is known as the cosmological horizon, more precisely, the event horizon. We will never know what lies in those remote, invisible corners of the cosmos that expansion is carrying away from us faster than light. Stars from those regions will never brighten our sky, meaning our nights will always be dark. What's more, because expansion isn't stopping, and, according to current estimates, never will. Even galaxies beyond our local group will eventually slip beyond our sight. To the naked eye, and even through the largest telescopes, we'll one day see only the stars of our own galaxy and a handful of neighboring ones, assuming they don't all merge together first. For the astronomer of the future, the night sky will be darker than it is today. But that's a story for the far, far future. Right now, what truly amazes me is that the simplest astronomical observation possible, I mean literally just looking up at the night sky, gives you key information about the universe and one of its fundamental properties. Usually, when astronomers are asked about the evidence for the Big Bang, they point to a few well-known standard things. For example, the cosmic microwave background radiation or the very expansion of the universe, which had to begin from something. But here it is, the simplest proof, right in front of our eyes, and anyone can see it for themselves. If the universe had been infinite in time, eternal, you wouldn't see night at all. You'd live in a constant day. So if someone is looking for proof of the Big Bang, all they really need to do is step outside at night and think about the darkness of space 